This is going to take you through the first half of the digestive system. It starts out by asking you what's the overall function, and of course that would be digestion. This is just another way to say that. Uh, this was just an interesting video that I found and I thought I would share with you. It's amazing what some people decide should be eaten. So have you figured out what they're pulling out of his stomach? So far three of them. Four of them. Five toothbrushes, but we're still going. Six. Seven. That one's not a toothbrush. I'm not sure what that was. But swallowed something he wasn't supposed to. Eight. Eight toothbrushes plus something else. Nine toothbrushes. So that was the end of what this person had decided to eat. Uh, incidentally, a related clinical term from a previous chapter was pica. Pica is when a person craves a non-food item. Um, this is one of those really weird cases of pica. Usually when a person craves a non-food item, they crave like dirt or or ice, but this dude, for whatever reason, craved toothbrushes. Hmm. All right, after that, you have this picture to label. It's directly out of your textbook, but I'm just going to run you through the parts. Some of our parts up to the top are shared by the respiratory system and the digestive system, um, but they left the nose out of here because, again, most, most of the time you don't eat through the nose. Uh, you're going to ingest food into the oral cavity. Your tongue's going to help you taste it. Your teeth are going to help you chew it. Your salivary glands are going to release some enzymes to help start the process of breaking down that food. Once your food is rounded into a mass called a bolus, you're going to swallow that food down the pharynx, specifically the oropharynx to the laryngopharynx. And then we're going to enter the esophagus. We don't spend too long there. From the esophagus, we go to the stomach. Stomach releases some new enzymes to help us digest food, specifically proteins. We've got acid in there that can kill some bacteria and it helps to make the enzyme work better. Uh, from the stomach, we're going to enter the small intestine, which has three parts. The duodenum is the smallest. It's only about a foot long, and yet it's arguably one of the more important parts of the small intestine because both the liver and the pancreas shunt their products into the duodenum to help you digest your food. The jejunum is the middle, about eight-ish feet of the small intestine. This is where you're doing most of your chemical digestion, where enzymes are going to be breaking down nutrients into smaller building blocks. And then the ileum is the last ten-ish feet of the small intestine. This is where most of your absorption is going to happen. Absorption is when you actually get your food into your body, because technically food in your esophagus isn't in you. It's not in you till it passes through a cell membrane, and the ileum is where most of that happens. From the ileum, we enter the colon. Uh, the appendix dangles down off the bottom of the colon. The food doesn't really go down there. Maybe a couple little pieces will, but mostly this is just a bacterial fermentation chamber. The very bottom chunk of the colon is called the cecum, which again for humans it's not very big, it's just one little pouch. Above that you have the ascending colon, then the transverse colon, and then the descending colon. That leads us to this sort of S-shaped area, that's the sigmoid colon, so if it helps you remember S and sigmoid go together, then awesome. Um, after that, you get the straight shoot out, that's the rectum, and then the anus is the sphincter that controls when your feces actually gets to leave your body. Um, gallbladder helps the liver do its job, we'll talk about that later. Spleen is in parentheses because it's not actually part of the digestive system, but it is in here with the rest of these organs, we went ahead and labeled it at this point. Next up, which organs make up the alimentary canal? So this is the canal that the food actually passes through. You can pause the video to get all the names down. There are also accessory structures that are very important for the functioning of the digestive system. These usually secrete various chemical products onto your food to help you digest it better. The liver is the largest of the accessory structures, but I've got a few more that are listed there. Um, this gentleman was going in to have surgery and they 3D printed his liver so that they could map out the surgery before they went in. So this is the 3D print of his liver and this was the liver after it was removed from his body. Uh, what are the six processes that make up the um, functions of the digestive system? They're the words in the boxes through here. So ingestion is essentially put the food in your mouth. Uh, mechanical digestion is any physical process that you do to tear apart or physically break down your food. So they're giving you chewing as an example, and that's probably the best example. But also muscle action helps with mechanical digestion. 
Propulsion is just the process the smooth muscle does to help push food through the entire tube. So that starts at the beginning and works its way down. Chemical digestion is kind of like mechanical in that we are breaking food down, but where mechanical digestion is a physical process, chemical digestion is a chemical process. Specifically, we're going to be using enzymes to help us chemically break down large molecules into smaller molecules. Once we have digested our food down into small enough pieces, we can absorb it. Carbs and proteins are going to be absorbed into the bloodstream. Um, lipids, on the other hand, tend to have to be absorbed into lymph vessels. We'll talk about why that is later. Anything that cannot be absorbed gets released, so that's called defecation or elimination, whatever you want to call it. It's the act of pooping, essentially. Let's get passed through those. Peristalsis. This is, we talked about it last semester in smooth muscle. It's the rhythmic wave of muscle contractions that pushes food through any hollow canal, although we're talking about digestive system, so it pushes the food through the alimentary canal. Um, I probably showed you guys this video last semester, too. Uh, dude had a motorcycle accident. It's kind of difficult to see because it's blurry, but you can see things wiggling around in here. Oh, that That's was, all his intestines. Those are my intestines. And so you can see peristalsis pushing the food through there. Happens all day, every day. It's just that you're not usually aware of the fact that it's happening in there. Just like all the other organ systems that we have been talking about recently, we've got a serous membrane here. So for the heart, it was pericardium. For the lungs, it was the pleural membranes. Now that we're in the abdominal pelvic cavity, it's the peritoneum. The outer layer is the parietal peritoneum. The inner layer against the organs is the visceral peritoneum. We have a fluid-filled space in between them. This time that space is fairly large and the organs can move around a lot in the digestive system or in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, so yeah, the cavity is just that fluid filled space. So while this is a cadaveric photo, so none of our colors look quite right here, you can see there's a lot of space in between the organs and the body wall. All of that is the peritoneal cavity and there would have been fluid inside of there. Uh, mesentery. So this is the visceral peritoneum, but it's the visceral peritoneum that helps hold the intestines together as like one con concrete little structure. Um, this sort of, I don't even know what color to call that goldenrod. We'll make it pretty. This goldenrod stuff off through here, this sheet of tissue, that's the mesentery. And so it is just the peritoneum that helps anchor the organs together. Um, retroperitoneal organs are organs that are actually behind the peritoneal space. So here they've taken out all the organs that were in the peritoneal space and you're seeing the retroperitoneal organs. So the kidneys, the ureters, portions of the urinary bladder, those are all retroperitoneal. Peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum. Um, this I showed you guys last semester too. Uh, dude left the hospital AMA after he had complained of pain in his right lower quadrant. That's almost always a dead giveaway that there's some appendicitis. Uh, since he left without the surgery, his appendix ruptured and just flung bacteria into the entire peritoneal space, which remember, that's a huge space. So he doesn't have inflammation in just one small area. He's got inflammation over the entire abdominal pelvic cavity. That's why an appendix rupturing is fatal. Um, it's because you have an overwhelming infection once you've made it to that point. So that also answers the next question. This story, I just love this story. I don't know how many of you know this story, but dude was in Antarctica. He was the only doctor on the mission. He developed appendicitis while he was in Antarctica. And being the baller that he is, he used locals and took out his own appendicitis survived the procedure, didn't even develop an infection, went back home to Russia and just lived the rest of his life later on. And so just props to this dude. I can't even imagine doing that to yourself, but he did it because if he hadn't done that, he would have died. And so he really didn't have a lot of choice. It was either die on the operating table or die because your appendix ruptured and suffer for a few days before you die. So he chose this one and didn't die. So again, yay. All right. After that, I gave you this picture to label the tissue makeup in the alimentary canal. So we're going to have mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and then serosa or adventitia, whichever one you want to call it. Our mucosa through most of the digestive system is going to be simple columnar epithelial tissue. We're going to have goblet cells all over the place to make lots of mucus. The submucosa is going to have various glands to make more mucus and to make some digestive enzymes to help us break down our food. The muscularis is going to have a circular layer of smooth muscle that can squeeze the tube and then a longitudinal layer of muscle that runs down the length of the tube. When it contracts, it makes the tube fatter but shorter. Both of those two things, so for peristalsis, this layer contracts, then this layer contracts, and they keep alternating and that helps to push the food through the tube. Um, the cirrhosis is, again, the peritoneum from earlier.
Uh, three major functions of the mucosa, I'm going to skip the most obvious one. In the areas where the food has already been digested down small enough, it's going to be what absorbs our nutrients from the food that we eat. And we've got a thicker layer of cells here so that we also have a little bit of protection. Now it's again not, I mean it, it does its job when it comes to protection, but because there's bacteria on the food you eat and we need nutrients from our food, it's not the most protective layer that you have in you. But it again does a pretty good job of keeping most of your pathogens out of the body. Uh, which layer of the alimentary canal carries out peristalsis? That would be the muscularis, which again, circular layer, longitudinal layer. Next up, which of the processes occur in the mouth? So remember, there were six processes. Basically, all of them happen except there's no elimination happening here. And none of your food is a small enough molecule that you absorb it in the mouth. And so there's very little absorption happening here. If you have very small molecules, like you can absorb a little bit of water in the mouth, you can absorb some smaller molecules like caffeine in the mouth, but really there's like none of your carbohydrates are small enough yet to absorb here. And so we're just doing those four processes. Structures. So the uvula is that little punching bag thing that hangs down at the back. It helps you when food hits it. It helps to initiate swallowing. There's also a gag reflex thing happening there. Um, tongue, you've got your taste buds on there, so of course it helps you with that, but it does also help you shape food. Um, this child has a medical condition that makes the tongue protrude from the mouth like that. It's too large for inside of his mouth, and so this is not normal anatomy in this case. Hmm. Uh, a bolus. Bolus is a medical term for just like one of something, so you can push a bolus of a drug in an IV line. Um, here in this case, a bolus is the rounded mass of food that you swallow. So after you like, I don't know, eat a cracker, you chew it for a bit, you mix it with some saliva, you shape it into a bolus, and then once it's shaped, you can swallow. Saliva is what helps to lubricate the food, plus there's some enzymes inside of there that are going to be fairly helpful. Mumps, I will hit on just briefly. Mumps is one of those infections that we had almost eradicated, and then the anti-vaxxer movement came on board and stopped vaccinating, and so it is back. There was a case of it here. Uh, Keene actually had a larger community that had it, but there were cases in Cleburne as well back in, what was it, like 2016, something like that. And that was all because of people who didn't vaccinate their children. Mumps, for the most part, you get it, it sucks for a while, it inflames your salivary glands, and so you end up with your salivary glands being very large and swollen, usually just on one side of your face. And most of the time it goes away after that. However, there are people who get severe complications, including it can get into the brain and cause encephalitis, which can be fatal. In men, it can break the blood testis barrier and lead to orchitis, and that orchitis is inflammation of the testes, which can lead to permanent infertility. And so this isn't something that you should just shrug off because again, it can kill you. And if it doesn't kill you, it can make it so you never have babies of your own. So make sure you vaccinate your kids. This is part of the MMR vaccine. The second M stands for mumps. It's measles, mumps, rubella, which is German measles. And so that's what's going on there. Uh, dry mouth. Many drugs have a side effect called dry mouth. Why is it a problem is the question that you have. So not only is it uncomfortable for a person to have dry mouth, it dramatically increases the chances that a person's teeth rot inside of their mouth. Um, so this is what happened to this person off over here. They had already had the crown installed, but even with the crown, it still rotted the tooth off over here. What was special about this excision was there's the root, and you don't normally see an intact tooth root when they pull a tooth out of a person. That's the part that makes this super suck when you have it removed because that's the painy part of the tooth if you want to look at it that way. Mm. Uh, let's see, describe the function of teeth. Mastication, they chew. Uh, primary and permanent dentition. So primary teeth are your baby teeth. Permanent teeth are your adult teeth. Uh, know how many teeth make up each set. I've got the numbers that are written there. What is important about this is for people who never get their wisdom teeth, none of them, they only get 28 teeth in their permanent set. I, for example, only have my top two wisdom teeth, my bottom ones never form, so I have 30 teeth in my permanent set. For people who get all four wisdom teeth, they can have 32, and so the number varies depending on whether or not the wisdom teeth actually come into play. Um, after that, I gave you this picture, and I told you to make sure you know the names of the teeth, but you didn't have to worry about years, and that's because everybody's teeth erupts whenever they feel like it. Like, my 12-year molars didn't come in until I was 18, so I don't want you to learn about dates so much as I want you to know names. So, there's two central incisors, there's two lateral incisors, a right and a left. There's two canines, a right and a left. There's premolar one, premolar two. These look kind of like molars, except they only have one root. 
And then you've got molars. Molars have multiple roots. The back tooth back here is the wisdom tooth. It is a molar, but again, not everybody gets those. What I always recommend is start naming from the front. Incisor 1, incisor 2, central lateral, canine, premolar, premolar, molar, molar. If you start from the back and you assume this is molar 3, but then that person didn't get a wisdom tooth, it's going to throw all your other numbers off. So start from the front and work your way around. Mm. Uh, this is just one of those nice gory x-rays that I found online that uh, somebody was claiming this person uh, was still had their baby teeth in place, but way no, that is not what's happening here. P babies don't get three rows of teeth, which is what this person's got going on in several of these layers. They have hyperodontia, which means they have formed way more teeth than they are supposed to have inside of there. So believe it or not, dentists see some weird stuff that you would not believe. Hmm. Next up. Gingiva are your gums. Enamel is the hardest substance you can make. It only covers the crown of the tooth, which is the portion of the tooth that's above the gums. It does go a little bit below, but not very much, and so that's the enamel. Um, everybody has always told me that you cannot make more enamel, and if your enamel gets damaged, you cannot repair it. There are lots of toothpaste that say that they will repair your enamel, and even I've had I've asked multiple dentists, they still tell me that those toothpaste do not actually repair your enamel. If you get a breach, the only way that you can fix it is to have them drill the hole out and then shove something new in there like amalgam or whatever. So try to take care of your enamel. It's apparently all you're going to get, although they are working on ways to make that better. Cementum is this brown layer that you have inside of here. Essentially, it's like a glue that helps to hold your tooth in place. In addition to that, we've got ligaments. That's these little things that are connecting the tooth to the maxilla or the mandible, depending on whether they're upper teeth or lower teeth. Hmm. Um, let's see. Dentin is all the blue stuff. It makes up the bulk of the tooth. It's kind of like bone, but it's not really. The pulp cavity is this upper portion up here where there are blood vessels and there is a nerve supply. So if, again, you get a cavity and it breaches here, you're going to know it and it's going to suck. The root canal. So there's a difference between a root canal, as people talk about it, and the root canal. The root canal is the canal that goes through the tooth root that takes the nerve and the blood back up into the pulp cavity. Root canal therapy is when you had a cavity breach into the pulp cavity and so they had to come and drill out the whole tooth and then like crown or cover the whole entire thing so they had to drill all the way in here. So there's the root canal which is this tube and then there's root canal therapy which fixes when things go wrong inside of the pulp cavity or the root canal. Oh, well that kind of takes me to the next question. So. If you have a cavity that breaches the enamel and it breaches the dentin, that means the bacteria that help to form that cavity now have access to your bloodstream, and that's not okay. Not only does it hurt because you have a cavity that's affecting near a nerve, but that bacteria can actually lead to sepsis or endocarditis or lots of problems because the bacteria have access to that bloodstream. So when they do root canal therapy, they take um, what I've always heard is like the most painful thing. I've never needed a root canal, so I don't really know for sure, but they say that it's really sucky. They take it and they drill down and they remove the entire pulp cavity and they clean it all out to get all the bacteria out that had been inside of there. And then they fill it and then they cap it so that you don't get that infection that might have been problematic for later on. Notice that this person, like the infection had gotten down into the bone in this little cartoony picture. And that bone doesn't heal super well, although it can heal. It just takes a lot of time for it to do that. And so that's one of the reasons why they want to do a root canal or the root canal therapy, I should say. Factors that can lead to dental caries. So this is another one of those wonderful gory pictures. There is so much wrong with this picture. Um, but most notably, as we're talking about it here, he's got some cavities, he's got some missing teeth, he's got a lot of problems. He, if I remember right, this dude has not brushed his teeth since he was 12 or something insane like that. So this is my friendly reminder to you guys, brush your teeth. This is disgusting. Um, the reason why you get cavities, so it's partly bacteria, but it's only partly bacteria. When you eat a bunch of food that contains a lot of sugar, the bacteria in your mouth ferment that sugar and in the process they produce acid and that acid breaks down the enamel in your teeth. So it's partly sugar and it's partly bacteria. So that's why they tell you don't eat a lot of sugar. Brushing your teeth helps to get the acid away from your teeth. It helps to get any accumulated sugar away from your teeth and it helps to get some of the bacteria off too. So brushing and flossing can help to prevent this stuff and just, just brush your teeth. <laughs> 
Uh, gingivitis, uh, I can't talk for some reason. Gingivitis is inflammation of the gums. So notice these gums look very red and unhappy. We've got a big thick layer of tartar on there, which is why the gums look unhappy. If you floss your teeth and your gums bleed, that means you're leaning towards gingivitis. Your gums should not bleed as you brush or floss. And so make sure you don't just brush your teeth, but you brush your gums. They are living tissue that need maintenance as well. Periodontal disease means that you don't just have cavities, it's more than that. You're actually starting to get problem with the bone that's holding the teeth where they're supposed to be. So the maxilla and the mandible are actually starting to decay. Um, as I say here, there are genetic components. So there are people who, it doesn't matter, they take the best care of their teeth in the world, they're still gonna get this, but they can slow it down, they're still gonna get it. But there are also the people who don't brush their teeth since they were 12, and they're gonna get this because they didn't take care of their teeth. Hmm. Next up, function of the pharynx, swallow food. Remember, it is part of the respiratory system as well. Uh, function of the esophagus, it's just a tube food travels through. I don't know if the current edition of the book still says it, but one of the old editions says that if you're standing upright, it only takes you about eight seconds to have food pass down the entire length of your esophagus. Even if you are upside down and gravity is not helping you, food will still get to the stomach through the esophagus because of the peristalsis that happens in there. Between the esophagus and the stomach, you have a sphincter muscle that closes when you don't have food passing through so that your stomach acid doesn't wash back up into the esophagus. That sphincter muscle is called sometimes the gastroesophageal sphincter, which makes sense because gastro means stomach. You can guess what esophageal means. The old name is cardiac sphincter, and that's because the symptom for this is heartburn. And so they called it cardiac sphincter because when it fails, you get heartburn. So what is heartburn? Failure of that sphincter, the stomach acid washes up. Your stomach has a bunch of modifications to deal with the acidity in there. Your esophagus does not. So if that stomach acid washes up into the esophagus, you're essentially creating chemical burns in your esophagus. So the condition that you have if you get heartburn, the symptom is gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD for short. What this means is that sphincter, the cardiac sphincter failed, so the stomach acid is refluxing back into the esophagus and you end up with heartburn as a symptom. Um, Nexium and some of the other newer drugs are what are known as proton pump inhibitors. If you remember, acids are proton donors, so proton pump inhibitors prevent your stomach from making acids. There are some weird side effects that can go along with that, and so don't take those unless your doctor has specifically told you to take those. Antacids are just bases. Remember, if you add a base to an acid, it neutralizes it. And then they can do surgery to try to stabilize that sphincter muscle so that it's not opening up when it's not supposed to. Now, one of the other issues is that sphincter muscle, the cardiac sphincter, it is supposed to be sitting in the wall of the diaphragm. I'm gonna come over here for just a second. So the cardiac sphincter would be right here. It is supposed to be in line with the diaphragm. So the diaphragm actually helps to stabilize the cardiac sphincter. In certain people, or due to certain events, like you eat too much too fast, what will happen is the stomach will get bigger and it will protrude a portion of it up so that instead of the cardiac sphincter being in line with the diaphragm, it's up above it. So diaphragm is down here, here's their cardiac sphincter. So this portion of the stomach is not supposed to be here. What I need you to remember, and I'll come back to this picture for this is, what's supposed to be here? Your heart is supposed to be here. So if you have a portion of the stomach protruding up into where your heart is, you can see that would be not only very uncomfortable, but it's decreasing the area available for the heart, which means it can start to play around with your blood pressure and that's not okay. So what they're gonna do is surgically pull this back down and try to help restabilize so that the sphincter muscle stays in the diaphragm where it's supposed to be. Uh, next, mastication is just chewing, deglutition is just swallowing. Uh, these are the things that are happening in the stomach. It is possible to ingest in the stomach. Uh, people sometimes have feeding ports that go directly into the stomach. That, that's not normal, however, that is for people who have problems with their upper digestive system. Um, elimination can kind of happen through the stomach if you're in a vomity sort of mood, but again, that's not usually happening here. So we're just doing these things in the stomach. Mm. Now, chyme. We haven't talked about what digest uh, gastric juice is just yet. That's gonna come up in just a little bit. But gastric juice is the secretions that the stomach does. So it's mucus and it's acid and it's enzymes. Well, if you mix that with food, you get chyme is how you say that word. Um, if you have eaten recently and then vomited, what you have vomited up has been chyme. 
Um, I'll come back to that later on when I talk about another thing you can vomit up. Rugi. Your stomach has all these folds in it to make it very expandable. Those folds are called rugi. Um, your bladder has some of those too, so that'll come back to us a little bit later on. Uh, next up, cardiac region is the portion of the stomach that's right next to the cardiac sphincter. These are just to show you why overeating is not a good idea. So this was a food competition person. Think like how many hot dogs can you eat in a 10 minute period? And this is his stomach at this point. And notice all the intestines have been shoved off to the bottom side. The liver has been shoved up where it's not supposed to go. We are taking up a portion of the area where the lung was supposed to be. This cannot be comfortable for a person to have to go through this. And it can be dangerous. It just depends on a lot of other factors as well. All right. Fundus is, there's that little portion of the stomach that bumps up towards the diaphragm. That's the um, fundus. And then the body is the main chunk. This is another one of those people eating something they shouldn't have. It's called a bazaar or bezoar, depending on how you want to say it. Let's see if you can figure out what this person ate that they should not have. Hopefully that bottom part kind of told you what it was. That is a giant hairball. Um, there are people out there who have psychological conditions where they eat their hair. I think it's called trichophagia. Um, and this person ate so much of their hair that it developed into this huge bezoar that was so large it could not progress into the duodenum. In fact, a portion of this had gotten stuck at the sphincter between the duodenum and the stomach so that we had a lot of problems that were going on. So they had to go in surgically to remove that. So if you're a person who eats your hair, stop that. Mm. All right, so here's what we've said. Cardiac region is the portion right near the cardiac sphincter. Fundus is this portion that bumps up towards the diaphragm. Body is the main chunk of the stomach off down here. Next up, the pyloric region is the portion that's closer to the back door. So the pyloric valve is the back door that controls when things get to move from the stomach into the small intestine. And the pyloric region is the portion of the stomach right next to that. Mm. Omentum is the visceral peritoneum that goes over the stomach, so it's basically all of this jazz up here. Mm. Um, the stomach wall has been modified in two places, so it still has mucosa, so mucosa muscularis and then serosa, but the mucosa has been modified so that there are all these pits, and these pits are going to have multiple cells that we're going to talk about in a second. And then the muscularis does not just have the circular and the longitudinal layer, it has a third layer of smooth muscle in it that's called the oblique layer. Your book talks about these churning waves, but that helps to mix the food up really well with the acid and the enzymes being produced in the stomach. Mm. So from there we talk anatomy. So the gastric pit is this little indentation in the mucosa of the stomach. It leads to the gastric glands, which are the bottom part of those pits, if you want to look at it that way. The pits and the glands are going to contain numerous different kinds of cells. Um, those cells are going to be producing gastric juice. So. First one of those cells that we're going to mean are all these pink cells off down here. They're mucus cells. They do exactly what the name says. Next up, you have these sort of, I don't know, Pac-Man looking cells. Those are parietal cells. These are the cells that secrete the acid. It is specifically hydrochloric acid, which is that HCl right there. They also secrete intrinsic factor, which is going to help us absorb vitamin B12, which we've talked about before. Chief cells are these sort of pinky purple cells down here at the bottom. They secrete a pre-enzyme called pepsinogen. When pepsinogen mixes with hydrochloric acid, it converts pepsinogen into pepsin, which is an active enzyme that digests protein. Then we have these triangular blue cells. Those are enteroendocrine cells. They make some hormones that help regulate the activity of the other cells, the chief cells, the parietal cells, and the mucus cells. It stimulates them to make their products more. Um, so the chemicals and what their functions are, hydrochloric acid decreases the pH so that the pH of your stomach is around 2. That stomach acid also helps convert pepsinogen into pepsin. Pepsinogen is a pre-enzyme that is released in an inactive state, sort of like fibrinogen back in the blood chapter. 
When pepsinogen mixes with acid, it becomes pepsin, which is a protein digesting enzyme. So if you've eaten some beef recently, you start to digest it in the stomach with the pepsin that gets activated by that stomach acid. The gastrin produced by the enteroendocrine cells stimulate the other cells to do their thing. And the intrinsic factor helps you absorb vitamin B12. Mm -hmm. Um, how does the stomach not digest itself? Well, I think your book still says it kind of does, but it regenerates so quickly that it doesn't get damaged in the process of doing that. There is a very thick layer of mucus that lines the stomach, and that layer of mucus is also very protective, but it still does have to regenerate more cells all the time. Um, if your mucus layer is not thick enough, and or if your stomach lining does not regenerate fast enough, you can actually digest holes in the mucosa of the stomach. That's what an ulcer is. You have digested a hole in the mucosa of your stomach. So a peptic ulcer essentially can occur anywhere in your digestive system, but a gastric ulcer is one that occurs in the stomach, and that's what's happened here. If you ever vomit up blood, this is the most likely culprit. It's not the only reason that can happen, but it's the most likely culprit. Gastric ulcers are also the result of a bacterial infection, but I think we'll talk about that more later. Uh, pernicious anemia we have hit multiple times. If you don't make intrinsic factor or you don't get enough vitamin B12, your red blood cells don't get made correctly, so you end up with pernicious anemia. Um, what are some things that can lead to emesis? So emesis is vomiting. Um, any sort of pathogen that produces specific toxins called gastrotoxins or enterotoxins, those tend to make you want to throw up. If you eat too much, like that dude who ate too many hot dogs, that can make you want to vomit. If you drink too much, we've all been there, that can make you throw up. Some people, if they eat really spicy food, it'll make them throw up. And then some drugs, think chemo, they can make you throw up too. Um, the medulla oblongata is where your uh, emetic center is located. It is important that you understand that vomiting can be life-threatening if it happens for an extended period of time. On the short term, it can lead to dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. These two things can make your nervous system not work and can make your kidneys fail. If it's happening more on a long-term basis, it also damages your esophagus, which increases your risk of esophageal cancer, and it wears away the enamel of the teeth. Like, Do you notice how the enamel here is nearly see-through at this point? This person was bulimic, and so bulimia is characterized by a binge purge, and so the purging involves vomiting in a lot of cases, or laxative abuse, but that's another story. And so here the vomiting is wearing away this person's teeth. Um, that is where I'm gonna stop this video. We will pick up with small intestine in the next one.